thank you to the Foster Foundation for hosting us. They do this for environmental groups and other organizations, and it's just a terrific public service, and I think it's creating a new, a, a, a new gem in Palo Alto that people who've had the chance to visit can now tell their friends and others, so we're very grateful to be here. You got that? Just want to make sure that you're on. Great. I'm very glad to uh, represent Actera and introduce the launch of our fall 2017 public lecture series. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors, including the Bay Area Air Quality Management <laughs> District, and also uh, uh, Mary Gilliland and her husband, uh, Clint, who have been sponsors for this series. I've known Steve Wesley in different ways for, I think, almost 30 years. Uh, and we followed uh, related paths in energy and environmental issues. And I was just so delighted when I reached out to him uh, to ask if he would come and speak for Actera in, in, at this time. He's the founder and managing partner of the Wesley Group, a sustainability venture firm. Uh, you may remember Steve was also elected to one of the highest offices in the state of California as the controller and helped keep our budget in check. He also was an executive at eBay, and early in his career he worked for the U.S. Department of Energy. One of the reasons I invited Steve is I think he has a unique gift of linking the trends in market development around energy and sustainability with the products and innovation in Silicon Valley. And uh, he's an inspiring speaker. We're delighted to have him, and we welcome him to Actera. California. 
California, again, always the leader, unilaterally passes legislation that says if you want to sell cars in this state, they must be constructed completely different from every other car in the world. And Detroit said, what are you kidding? We're supposed to make you know, 50 different models of cars for every state? But we have the market cloud that we do. And you're proactive, and you're seeing the future, you can literally dictate the directions of industries. Within a decade, every state in the country, virtually every country in the world passed similar catalytic converter legislation. It was dramatic. And we began to have cleaner air every year from the mid 70s until the early 2000s. And what happened then? The air became more polluted every year starting in about 2003. The rise of China and Asia. Today, over California, we're getting cleaner every day, but about 25% of the pollution over the West Coast comes from China. We have commissioned a new coal plant in the U.S. Uh, for uh, the western part for some time. China, until last year, was putting on one to two new coal plants per week. Per week. We were doing one to two per year. China's putting scratching brakes on it. Why? Because the Green Sierra Club uh, influence liberals? No. Massive civil disturbance in China because of this. We're living in an era of big data. I'm going to come back to this. The Harvard Health Project has said 83 million Chinese are expected to die of lung disease in the next 25 years. If you go there, it is dramatic. You can barely see. It looks like a Mad Max dystopian movie, and the Chinese get it. They don't want to see civil disturbances, and it's everywhere you go. What I want to convey to you is we are already moving out of that, already into this. But we're well on our way to this, and it's happening faster than ever. It is an era of megawatts. We can do plenty of solar, but the energy we can avoid using at all is the best of all. And we can do it by being smart, sharing economy, new models. And by the way, as an investor, because you have all heard the narrative. I had this debate with Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, who said, by the way, an Exxon board member, well, of course, Steve's right that clean energy is nice, but it's never going to be more than 1% or 2%. And it is a job killer. <laughs> Wrong. Wrong on both fronts. California, the first pass legislation, mandating would be at 20% renewable by 2010. People said, impossible. Can't happen. Job killer. 500,000 people in the clean tech economy in California, by and large, new paying jobs, fastest growing sector of the economy. This isn't a job killer, this is the future. And they're by and large jobs, like building solar windmills, that you can't export easily. This is the future. And by the way, for the investors in the group, much higher gross margins, which means you get bigger returns, which means you get put more money back into it. This is not only the future, it is a win-win-win for the economy. Thank God, California's a leader in it. Let me just ask you a trivia question before I go to the next slide. A lot of people say, you know, it's going to be this solar stuff. I love it. But, but how long is it going to be before we're actually putting as much solar and wind online? And the question I have for you is, what year do you think, globally, not just in liberal California or Massachusetts, but globally, what year do you think the majority of new power, the utilities, these are by and large not lefty organizations, energy utilities, put the majority of power online that is renewable as opposed to carbon based? How long do we have to wait to get to that point? <laughs> Most people think 2030, the gentleman said 2017. I used to work at eBay. Do I have a higher offer? <laughs> so, it's a trick question, folks, globally. It happened four years ago. 
You know, you got Mr. Trump saying, I'm bringing coal back. He's not bringing coal back. There are barely any public coal companies left that didn't be listed. They're virtually out of business. And by the way, folks, this may upset a few. Nuclear's not coming back either. And it's not because I don't like it, the Sierra Club doesn't like it, it's just no one can afford to finance a new nuclear plant. They're about 20 billion in the world. And they aren't as greedy as a lot of people will say either. The carbon that goes into building one of these things, it, it's extraordinary. But realistically, coming from the world of finance, they're just not getting financed. Even the ones they tried to build in places like Alabama, they have largely abandoned, created huge problems for things like the Southern Company. This is where the world is going. Let me tell you, as the cost of solar and wind goes down, the uptake goes up. And it's going up dramatically. At the top, we've got the cost of uh, solar in the dark purple, uh, the wind and the light purple. The red solar is coming down is dramatic. And this is through 16. In 17, we're largely at parity in most places in the US. But the punchline here, folks, is natural gas prices go. Up and down, no one knows. They're volatile. I've heard it because hard to base decisions on. Solar goes down. Every year it goes down. It only goes one direction, which is down because you make the panels more efficient. You're going to see us moving towards the solar world more, and it's happening all over. India, Prime Minister Modi, quintupling, not doubling, quintupling the output of uh, solar in that country because their pollution problem is on path to overtake China. What Xi Jinping has done in China is make China the solar power of the world, far away eclipsing anybody else. These are smart things to be doing. The U.S. has to keep up. But the missing link of all of this is renewables because they're getting to be cheaper. They're much better uh, for the environment. Public opinion dramatically supports them. But the one remaining problem with renewables is storage. storage. The sun doesn't shine all day. The wind doesn't blow all day. And they say, ha, ah, we can't depend on it. All the nuclear people. <laughs> Finally, for the first time, we're seeing the co cost of storage going down dramatically. You can look at the curve yourself. It was going down at about 7 uh, to 8% a year. You can see the numbers right here, and then bang, 35%. 35%. It's like people woke up. What caused this to happen? Tesla. <laughs> God bless you. I used to serve on the board of Tesla. I can tell you stories you wouldn't believe. Mr. Musk was not easy. <laughs> uh, by the way, especially for me, because I turned the audit committee. But I leave those for the outside. But he makes stuff happen. He built this thing called the Giga Factory. Soon to be the largest building in North America. Bigger than the Pentagon. And the symbolism of that speaks volumes alone. You know how big a Costco is? A box, roughly 100,000 square feet. And this facility is 10 million square feet. Picture 100 Costco's all lined up next to each other. It's a building a mile and a half long, one building. They're building a number of lithium ion batteries never anticipated before. The people who own the LG, uh, lithium ion battery uh, world franchise was LG Chem in Korea and Panasonic in Sanyo in Japan. We used to run around moping when we were at Tesla saying, What do you mean no one makes these damn things in North America? We're completely dependent on the Japanese and the South Koreans. Why is that? And Musk said, I don't care, we'll change it. We got the same finance. It has driven the cops down. And here's what I want to leave you with. Almost all of us, if you go to business school, you're in the working world, you're in business, you know more or less what a barrel of oil costs. The global economy is historically based on that. It is about Amazon. $50. God bless you. We've got some smart people there. Everybody kind of knows it. 
I'm telling you right now, in the future, you're going to know what the cost per kilowatt of energy storage is. Most of my life, it has been closer to $2,000. In the 2000s, it came down a bunch to here. Look where it has gone in seven or eight years. This changes the entire energy dynamic. And then we got 1979, 2017, and we saw that. And that's because LG Kim is in high gear. There's a global competition you haven't seen. I'm here to tell you that the number of electric vehicles you're going to see within five years in every country in the world will astound you. $100,000 Teslas are lovely. You're not going to sell that many. $35,000 Teslas, astonishing. Sold to 500,000 orders in record time. You will see cars, electric vehicles, below $25,000 before you know it. And they have performance like Porsches, ranges you won't believe. The whole world is going that direction. We've had the senior management of BMW, Volkswagen, uh, SAIC in China in our office in the last three months. They will all tell you the same thing. Right behind it, autonomous. So, this was the penetration of electronic vehicles in the old world. This is what it is today. And folks, in three or six months, it's going to be like that. Stay tuned. <laughs> so here's what I want to run by quickly. We're in a whole new world. But it's not just a world of renewables. It is a world of innovation. The speed and rapidity of which we've never seen before. And I would suggest to you it's based on three things. First, straight out of Silicon Valley, what I call the new ethos the new mindset. Whatever your company is, whatever the business is, however well you've done, get ready to cannibalize it with the next big thing. And this is particularly problematic for places like Harvard and Stanford that are the best, Toyota that's the world's hard, largest auto company, the United States. For the people on top, they kind of want to do things the way they've always been done. The new ethos is, you need to get ready to cannibalize yourself. Steve Jobs lashing people on with the iPod. And after 12 arduous months, they get it out. The market cap of Apple goes through the ceiling. and Everybody says, my god, he's a visionary. It's extraordinary. Let's take a break. And he's like, back to work. <laughs> We're going to completely cannibalize the iPod. I've got this new idea about this thing. We're going to call it the iPhone. You're seeing a whole rebirthing of new technologies. And I want you to remember each of these. This internet of things combined with big data. We, I run a venture capital firm, and every day we're seeing people come in with big data and IoT solutions that are changing every sector of the economy. Combine that with new economic models like the sharing economy. Unconceivable a decade before changing the global economy. So in just a minute, internet of things all based on the smartphone. But Cisco tells us, and we've gone from zero of these devices to two billion in an extraordinary time. There's never been a consumer product that has gone from nothing to 30% of the global population in a decade, unheralded. But Cisco's telling us the number of things with internet connections is going from two billion to 50 billion in record time. Every part of your life, your car, my car is already online, your house, Every room in your house, your work, perhaps your clothing, it's all going to have intelligence in it. I just talked to this couple, and they said, oh my god, it was so cool. We did our 20-year anniversary. We renewed our vows. We went back to Africa. We went on the honeymoon. And I said, wow, how was it? What a change. And she said, we were out with the Maasai warriors, you know, the, the Serengeti planes, the people that are like average height is like 6'4". And she said, it was just like it was 20 years ago, except they're all holding the iPhones now <laughs> on the Serengeti, you know, wearing, it's, it is a whole new world. And as consumers, company builders, we need to understand that we here are changing the planet. But it's creating some issues. These devices are coming into our homes. They're privacy issues. There are cybersecurity issues. Some of you probably saw the highly publicized murder case where uh, a wife 
uh, killed the husband and they were admitting evidence from the Amazon Echo that got the entire discussion before she offed him. And the question is, uh, was it admissible or not? These are issues we need to get our arms around. If you're thinking of doing that, turn the stuff off. <laughs> Big data. We have access processing capability to bring data into every part of our lives. It leads to better decisions. It leads to lower carbon footprint. Think about this for everything we do, including making government work just a bit better. One of the biggest areas where you see it is cars will drive themselves. And people say, no, I'm a perfectly good driver. 38,000 auto fatalities in the US every year. And that's like a Vietnam War every year because frankly, we're not good drivers. 1.2 million fatalities nationally. You remember I talked about pollution getting uh, you know, better and better and then all of a sudden it's changing. Fatalities, auto fatalities in the country got better went down for 50 years. Why? Legislation, seat belts, airbags, all these things. We're smart people, we know how to fix it. Until three years ago, auto fatalities going up like crazy. Why? Look to your left and your right. <laughs> iPhones, iPhones, all this stuff. We're heading to autonomous vehicles faster than you want. Let me just start with Ford. Folks, Ford is the laggard in the North American auto space. We used to be technology leaders in the US, we're not except for Tesla. But the CEO of Ford said by 2021, so we're almost in 18, that's three years, mm -hmm. we're putting cars on the road at Ford without a steering wheel or gas or brakes. You, you're thinking, oh my God, I'm gonna hit something. I gotta jump up front and grab the wheel. There won't be one. Zooks is this, Apple is working on their own. They just debuted this at the LA Auto Show. And by the way, the punchline for those of us in the business, they all looked the same. <laughs> and they are, and by the way, the real kicker, I love telling you the story, they all have wooden floors in here. And why? Howard Schultz, Starbucks, it's not just coffee, we're building a third place between home and the office. This is not gonna look like a car. They want it to look like home. Your entertainment, game, reading, movie center. But I'm here to tell you, you'll be seeing autonomous cars faster than you know. The new version of Tesla, people have driven these from Los Angeles to New York with hands off the wheel and the gas. This is monitored by the computer, 96% of the trip today. So we are not that far out. I have driven in some of these vehicles, not just on freeways, which are easy. There's fully autonomous autonomy today, but on the side streets, and it's getting dramatically better as we speak. Within two years, you will start to see these things pop up on the roads. We'll tell you more about that. So it's these technologies, IoT, big data, permeating everything. Combine that with new uh, business models. I just, I have to tell this story. Cover of Time Magazine. I just had my 20th anniversary, and. If I went and told my wife, you know, I love you so much, we're gonna go to Rome and stay in someone's like back room, it wouldn't fly. <laughs> but for most of the public today, it not only flies, it makes a heck of a lot of sense and it's the future. Ponder this, most of my life, if you could stay, and I'm saying to young people in particular, if your folks were doing well enough to take you to a Hilton hotel, someone was doing something right, you, you'd made it. Those places were nice. You, it was a status symbol you'd arrived. And why not? These things are in 2,300 cities. It's extraordinary. A million rooms. Airbnb. 25,000 cities. Three times the rooms that Hilton has, but doubling every two years. And a larger market cap. And it's just the beginning of the sharing economy. So I talked about the new ethos. I talked about the new technologies. As or more important than all of that is this. It's the new customer. For the last 50 years, our economy, our government has been driven by baby boomers. And you know the ethos. It's 
I gotta have the biggest TV and I need the biggest car and then I'm gonna drive it home to the biggest house and three, three car garage and then I'm gonna throw it out and get a bigger one or an extra house. It's all been about more and I'm here to tell you it's all changing. We have a lot of behavior on millennial buying patterns and why do we care? As of 2017, millennials have passed baby boomers as the largest buying cohort in the world. That's what everybody wants to sell to. We are old news. <laughs> These guys here are the future, and this is what BMW, GM, Apple, and everybody else is honing in on. And what do these people want? By and large, three things. Number one, smaller carbon footprint in everything they do. Purpose-driven life. How about that? Uh, I'm here to tell you the current president will be the last baby boomer president we have. We're moving, put politics aside, we're moving to a whole different era of what people are looking for in candidates. Two, choices. Control over our environment. Complete connectivity to your car, your home, your job, all the time. Number three, cleaner air, food, and water. And millennials are very much similar around the world. When I was a kid, millennial, uh, a younger person here might be quite different from someone in Berlin, guarantee you is different from someone in Ankara or Shenzhen. Today, if you're at Ankara or Shenzhen, I've been to both, you're going to Starbucks and you're on your Apple iPhone. And you may be looking to YouTube as you go. So we've created from here, Silicon Valley, this new global economy. And a lot of people say, well, wow. So this clean tech thing, like, are people really making any money? And the answer is, if you're an investor, where have you been? These aren't just billion dollar companies. I wasn't kidding about millennials being the biggest buying cohort in the world. These are firms with tens of billions of dollars. Tesla, when we invested in Tesla, there were, this was just I think 12 years ago, 29 people at a warehouse in San Carlos. San Carlos, you know the Ada Meco of the world? <laughs> My wife said, are you crazy? Electric vehicles, 29 people? Have you gone mad? Larger market cap than Ford or General Motors in 12 years. This is what we are doing here. Airbnb, Uber, Mobileye, $15 billion firm from Israel out of nowhere. This is another one of our firms, Planet, that may uh, obsolete uh, parts of GPS. It is low orbital uh, uh, satellites with much greater visibility measuring every meter of the earth every day to help with information, whether it's defense, energy, agriculture, or making sure your car stays between the lines. Firms like this are changing the world. So I just want to do a quick case study, because I had a front row seat sitting on the board at Tesla. A lot of people Came, and I've been environmentalist active in the community for a long time. When the EV1 came out, people said, it's a conspiracy. <laughs> Who killed the electric car? And did you hear General Motors? They not only discontinued the line, they crushed every unit yes. at night. Yeah. Folks, yes. I'm a capitalist. I'm here to tell you it's a crappy product. They didn't have to crush them, but there was no conspiracy. It's the ugliest thing in the world. I wanted to show you the picture. It took eight seconds to go to 60 miles. That's a joke. There were, uh, the range was pathetic. No one wanted to buy them. That was the problem, and they were worried about the liability. They could have handled it a little better. It just wasn't a very good product. But fast forward, 16 years, and you come out with this instantly. Auto Trends Car of the Year. NHTSA, National Health and Traffic Administration, the safest car we have ever tested. Zero to 60 in under four seconds. They now have one that goes zero to 60 in 2.2 seconds. So it's a $100,000 or $90,000 car faster than a million dollar McLaren. Consumer Reports, highest customer uh, ratings ever seen producing at 1,000 a week compared to 660 total. It's a stunning story. Fast forward just a few years beyond that, they came out with this Model 3. 
This deals with the key issue of the day, getting it down in price so everybody can afford one because you're not going to clean up the environment until you make them affordable. And they fell 400,000 in 28 days. Biggest selling car in the United States is usually a Toyota Corolla. They sell about 265,000 in one year. So when you take 400,000 orders for a car, that is a big deal. And it's just the beginning. This is the Mercedes F15 on the market uh, soon. Uh, by the way, prototypes coming out next year for this, fully autonomous. And most of these cars, by the way, will drive forward and backwards equally well. There's no front and back per se. The only reason there's a front of a car is because we have two eyes going this way. These cars all have six cameras plus LiDAR plus radar. They will not hit other things. They will be safer and they will be completely bi-directional, which by the way is a godsend for people not able to drive. For poorer folks or people depending on public transportation, this drops the cost per mile driven by half. One of the best things that happens to the economy and it's great for the environment and it's showing up next year. This is the Gigafactory that I mentioned before. It's what's bringing it together. It's bringing us clean vehicles. It is enabling us to finally go to all renewables. And by the way, some of you have heard, I didn't include this slide tonight, but the nation of Norway has already said by 2025, in seven years, illegal to buy a gas or diesel vehicle in our country again. Now I happen to be Norwegian, there's only five million of us, no one really cares about us. <laughs> but India has 1.25 billion people. They've said illegal to sell a gas or diesel engine vehicle in our country by 2030. You say, okay, well, third world country, I'm not going to think about them either. England and France already mandated illegal to sell gas and petrol cars there by 2040. The U.S. will be at the same place, and I know there are people who are leaders in this movement right now, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. So I just want to close with these two slides. A lot of people say, well, Steve, these things will happen in 20 or 30 years. You saw how fast we went from zero smartphones to two billion. I just want to remind you, this is Fifth Avenue, New York City, Easter Day Parade. 1900, all you see are horse-drawn carriages. If you look really closely, there is one internal combustion vehicle there, and I promise you everybody thought he was nuts. <laughs> Just 13 years later, same street, same parade, same day. It's all internal combustion engine vehicles that happened in 13 years, the world changed like that. We were at the next inflection point to electric vehicles, to renewable energy, to autonomous vehicles. We're living in an extraordinary time. And it's being driven by us. And I really wanted to come tonight to challenge you, especially those of you in Terry's class and the other younger people here, to go out and reinvent the world. You have no idea what a special time this is. You have no idea how lucky you are to be here Bring me your business plans. You can change the world just like Steve Jobs did right here 30 years ago. Mark Zuckerberg did here 15 years ago. And I hope one of you is planning to do right now. So thank you for coming out tonight. to take questions. I just wanted to be provocative. Anything you want is fair uh, game. Uh, nothing's off limits. Ask away. I'm happy to take any and all questions. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. That was great. Uh, very promising. My question is that uh, you know the kind of cover says California is still America's future. Why are we so behind with uh, public transportation? And what yeah. do you think is going to happen with public transportation? Because we really are uh, behind almost every country. Yeah. So, um, three points. Uh, first, I used to be 
the California State Controller and the Chief Financial Officer for the state. And again, to my Democratic friends, I'm a lifelong Democrat. It's easy to say it's a conspiracy. We're terrible on public transportation. Forgive me for being just a little conservative. I'm a big fan of public transportation. The public transportation costs a lot. It works really well in Europe where there's high density. It works great on the East Coast where there's high density. This Boston, New York, Philadelphia, DC, it is awesome. In California, it's a little trickier. It works well in San Francisco. In the Bay Area, we've got to get our act together. 27 different transportation agencies that don't coordinate. Man, put pressure on your elected officials. But I will tell you, the cost is the guy who often had to like pay for this stuff was tricky. It is really, really expensive. And I just want you all to think about this for a minute. A lot, I know I have a lot of friends who support high-speed public rail. The initial estimate was 33 billion. The new estimate, 66 billion. I'm here to tell you it's gonna crest 100 billion, but that's not the bad part. The bad part is how much money is it gonna lose every year in perpetuity. And the rub is you fly over California, other than the LA to San Diego corridor and the Bay Area, we're not nearly that dense. So what we need to get smart about, because you gotta pay for this stuff, is how do you drop the cents per mile driven? That's why I'm going on so long about autonomous vehicles, because it completely imagines public transportation. I know your mindset, $100 billion, big trains, Governor Brown's legacy. Think distributed autonomous vehicles. They'll be accessible to the poorest amongst us. Combine that with things like the Hyperloop. I almost brought a slide on that. It's all about getting smart, particularly, and I say this to you in Palo Alto or Democrats, the folks on the left, our hearts are in the right place. We just need to think a little more about making sure we have cost-effective solutions. If we do that, we'll change the world. But you will see more public transportation here. We just need to be smart. The autonomous uh, vehicles, the combination with shared economy, that really brings out public transportation. So somehow, if we can Usually. kind of like bring these two together a little more efficiently and in a larger volume, I think in a way we can, in a local area, solve it. That is why I combine these three things, which to some people are disparate, but they're not. This IoT combined with big data, you're going to see low-cost autonomous vehicles. The big question is who's going to own cars in the future, and I think it, it's not going to be individuals. And contrary to popular opinion, I don't think it's going to be Google or Apple. It's probably going to be cities, maybe utilities. It will be accessible to everybody, low-cost, and you will see much more than we're attuned to now, two and three and four people in a uh, vehicle. Ma'am, yeah. and then we'll come to uh, you in the back next. Well, that's just to piggyback on, what, on your concern, because you know autonomous vehicles are fine, but the problem is the congestion on the roads. Huge. So if, if the sharing economy works, like you, you know, you think we're going to have more car pooling in the autonomous vehicle, that would be great, because it's a nightmare in the Bay Area with the traffic right now. I was in San Francisco today. You know, I live in the Menlo Park area. I allotted an hour and a half. I was still late. I, I got to within one mile of my destination 45 minutes. I did not get the last mile in 45 minutes. Let me underscore the autonomous vehicles. You won't be owning one. I probably won't be owning one. They'll be public. You won't need to have garages. Our whole city layout, and I want you to ponder this, the average city has about 15 to 20% of the city is set aside for parking lots and street line parking. That's going away. We're looking at companies now that help automate that, shrink it. It's going away. Our entire love affair with retail, malls, uh, for the younger folks here, that was like our entertainment. Forget buying. We would go to the mall. Just It was practically a verb. It's all going away. People are moving online. Um, we have an opportunity to put more green in our cities, to build more housing uh, in our areas. Uh, we just need to get smart about how we use these technologies. Right here, and then I'll take two more questions because I know we're getting late. Hi, Catherine Albert. I was fortunate enough to work on your editorial campaign. I remember. A former college professor of mine wrote to me, and it was a great experience. God bless you, Terry. So I'd like to know your thoughts about another run for political office. Ah, well. <laughs> um, so no, I won't be coy about this. We're raising our third venture capital fund now. We're investing in firms that change the world, like Tesla and Revolution Foods, which is the biggest provider in the United States of healthy food for school kids in poor districts. It's like WaterSmart that are changing the water use. 
uh, Catherine's one of the leading experts in the state on water conservation. She was very humble. What you've done is extraordinary. But I will run in the future. It's just a matter of when. Let me launch two kids off the college. I will be back. <laughs> All right. Thank you. A couple more, sir. Um, what about the security of the time? Just 143 million of us have had our data hacked. I mean, is there enough energy in Google and things going into really the security issue? No. We don't. <laughs> We're, we're old world thinkers. When we think about security, it's, I, I, forgive me here, we got a president who's like, I, I'm going to put barbed wire on the border. That's so yesterday. It, it's pointless. Colossal waste of money, not stopping anything. We need to be thinking about cyber security. It affects every part of our life. Let me just draw you a picture. There are two types of cyber security. The one you're all thinking about is, oh my God, every day the Pentagon was hacked. Like, Pentagon? Can't they protect anything? Target stores, the DMV, that happened when I was controller. I mean, everybody's records on everything. And the simple answer there is, by and large, if you put enough security software on the enterprise like a dome, you can by and large protect it if you have the right people. But the, re and the reason you can is because you have a lot of what they call big iron, big mainframes, and you've got a lot of space, and you put enough software, you can by and large protect it. The rub is, as every younger person here knows, we're living in a world where rapidly every part of our life is online because we have what are called endpoints, smartphones, Fitbits, stuff in the house. That is what we worry about being hacked. Citibank, scared to death, 18,000 ATMs, remote, zero security. A lot of people running around, I always laughed a bit about this, I shouldn't, like our former Vice President Cheney with pacemakers. You know, the, a lot of these things are extremely vulnerable in the, one of the fastest growing segments of our economy, and we're very involved in this, is developing software to protect us in our homes, on our persons, and so on. That is one of the big issues. But let me pause here. I'm a lifelong Democrat. I love all of our elected officials. Nancy Pelosi, 76. Jerry Brown, 78. Dianne Feinstein's 84. We are depending on these people to understand endpoint security. And I love all of them. We're ready for a new generation of leadership. We need people that understand this. This is the future of our economy. And most importantly, in the most pressing issue of the day, in my mind, is how we retrain quickly the 3.6 million people that drive a car or a truck for a living. Because our, Democrat, our, our government is not focused on that. Our president wants to build walls in Texas. He's really clueless. We, as a country, need to get smart about this because that is the way of the world and you're not putting these new technologies back in the bottle. We need to get smart. I've got an op-ed coming out on that with the West Coast head of McKenzie. That is what we should be talking about. Time for one more question and then I've got to get back and help a daughter with college applications. applications. <laughs> God help me. Yes. So what is the appropriate role, if any, for the federal government in all of this? I mean, the way you paint the picture, technology is moving regardless of where Washington is, where, where Washington stands on these issues. Well, I was hoping for some tougher questions tonight, but let me... <laughs> So like, what should the federal government be doing different? Like, damn near everything. I mean, we've got a, the head of the EPA that, uh, you know, is practically a lobbyist for the oil and coal industry. I, but top level, and let me try to depoliticize things a bit. When I was a kid, you really didn't know what the solutions to most of these public policy issues were. And we'd kind of get stuck in the Democrat, Republican thing. Today, we know. Flat out, I, I ran for and won statewide office in California, and most of the issues in the day, housing and so on, we know what the best practices are. We know why. We know who is the leader in global education. If you're wondering, it's Finland, South Korea, Japan, and Singapore. And we know almost exactly what they're doing. And by the way, it's not smaller classrooms. It's higher standard for teachers. It's accountability. Uh, it's using some matter of technology. There's stuff we know, and it's all about how do we better tune into best practices in the world to solve our problems? But we do need to do better at this job retraining issue. We need to be looking at where the country's going, things like cyber security, 
not barbed wire fences on the Texas border. We just need to be a little smarter about all of this. But let me stop here. I have spent half my life in government. It was fun, it was exciting. I've spent about half my life as an entrepreneur. What millennials are doing now to reinvent the new world is extraordinary. Most of our answers to things like global warming, cybersecurity are gonna be coming from the private sector, not the public sector, but they're gonna be coming from here. And I am utterly convinced to the core of my being that millennials, who by and large want to lead a more purpose-driven life, are going to be inventing the companies that are going to be helping to solve the problems we're facing today. And that is really my challenge to those of you here below 40, and I hope those of us who are over 40, especially the ones who are way over 40, will be helping you, not holding you back. So thank you.